Thank you so much, uh, Harry, Preeti, and the team for inviting me to speak here. And I'm enormously grateful also to the speakers who made way for me to speak earlier than scheduled so that I can hopefully catch my flight to Chennai. <clears throat> After all these absolutely fascinating cutting-edge presentation of technologies, I'm going to try and bring you back down to earth to talk about a technique which has been around for more than a century, something that many of you fortunately practice on a day-to-day -day basis. The topic given to me is mesothelioma and role of medical thoracoscopy. I was discussing with many of my colleagues in India, my close friends here in the room, and I gather we don't see much mesothelioma here. That's the impression I've got. Varies, depends on where you work in India. I work in a place called Preston, a small city just north of Manchester, and slightly north of that was a shipbuilding industry area, a town called Barrow. So I get referred quite a few patients with mesothelioma, or suspected mesothelioma. So thoracoscopy still has a major role in this group of patients. How many of you see mes... Not connected? Oh. Wonder why. How many of you see mesothelioma on a regular basis? Quite a few thoracoscopists. Would you, if, would you say the incidence once a year, would you see about 10 patients? Some of you. So it's uh, not insignificant, the incidence of mesothelioma, unlike what I've been led to believe. Seems to be projecting here for me. Thank you very much. The um, prediction was that mesothelioma incidence will go up steadily. In the UK, it was thought that we will see a drop after a tremendous increase in mesothelioma. We'll see a drop after 2020. We have seen a slight decline. For those who are unaware, the latency period for mesothelioma is about 40 years. So when um, we don't see that latency and period finishing and then the drop in the incidence, then it becomes all the more necessary to perform a procedure such as thoracoscopy for diagnosis. Quick conflict of interest, because the topic is thoracoscopy, I have been involved in the evaluation of semi-rigid thoracoscope over the last 20 years. Incidence in many countries is unclear. The lower incidence may be due to poor data quality. It may be due to higher mortality, due to other causes such as ischemic heart disease, or the epidemic is slowly starting to begin only in the recent past. We still know that asbestos is the principal etiological factor. In some studies in the past, more than 50% of patients with diagnosed mesothelioma did not have a clear asbestos history. Occupational history exposure is still the major cause of asbestos exposure and mesothelioma in more than 80% of cases. There is a suggestion, a hypothesis, that there could be other materials, other elongated minerals, such as irionite or fluoroidonite being reported in some, center, some countries like Turkey. There's also a hypothesis about a genetic predisposition, a germline mutation. What we look for is a BAP1 gene, even in tissue, to see whether that's missing. Ionizing radiation, interestingly, there are some reports, even therapeutic radiation could be a cause for mesothelioma. Back to the basics. This is a standard scenario, day to day, that we see patients with pleural effusion. We do an ultrasound, diagnostic pleural aspiration, contrast enhanced CT, and then we have a number of options thoracoscopy, image guided pleural biopsy, and so on. 
But when it comes to mesothelioma, the best diagnostic test is a thoracoscopy. I'll show you in a minute the, what the guidelines suggest about this. Critical, therefore, that you learn ultrasound on a regular basis and practice it prior to thoracoscopy. If you look at the guidelines, this is an algorithm from the BTS guidelines. It says right at the, uh, I don't know if the pointer is working, but it says there what is highlighted, if a patient has a previous history of asbestos exposure and mesothelioma is suspected, consider going straight to thoracoscopy because the diagnostic yield of thoracosynthesis in those patients varies between 8 and 35 percent. So no point wasting time, go straight to thoracoscopy is the suggestion. And thoracoscopy, as you know, has been around for more than 100 years, as I mentioned, and the number of different options available, we spoke about in the earlier session today on, uh, organized by Olympus. There's the age-old rigid thoracoscopy, there is the semi-rigid thoracoscopy, which has been available for nearly 20 years, nearly two decades now. And what we use most frequently is the semi-rigid thoracoscope, as good for the diagnosis of mesothelioma as the rigid thoracoscope. More recently, there has also been a mini thoracoscope available. This is a paper from Karan Madan and team from New, New Delhi, All India Institute showing the use of the rigid mini thoracoscope is almost as good as the semi-rigid thoracoscope. All of the data over the last few years has been very nicely summarized in this study, showing that thoracocentesis for mesothelioma can have a pretty low diagnostic yield. Whereas thoracoscopy, as it's highlighted there in the last column, whether it's rigid or semi-rigid gives you a diagnostic yield and accuracy more than 90%. Besides, if you look at the complication rate, the complication of rate of thoracocentesis and thoracoscopy are comparable, meaning to say that thoracoscopy is a safe procedure and should be practiced certainly in mesothelioma. The British Thoracic Society guidelines from 12 years ago, 13 years ago, incidentally are due to be updated and published very shortly. They say once again, what I've projected there, that the diagnostic yield is more than 92%. The European Respiratory Journal Review also stated that we recommend talc budrage via thoracoscopy to try and do everything in one sitting, a matter of 40 minutes, do get adequate diagnosis with a yield more than 90%, effective drainage, and perform talc pleurodesis. Just some images for you. In mesothelioma, there can be a variety of appearances. This is through the uh, thoracoscope. You can see on the left top, you can see a little bit of thickening and hyperemia. The next one is a shiny pleural plaque. The one below, just diffuse pleural thickening and the one to the right showing a few nodules appearing, and then obvious malignancy seen with multiple nodules, thickening, and irregularity. So what is new in addition? A question that I'm often asked when I visit to India in uh, plural seminars is that when there is diffuse plural thickening, it's quite difficult to one, get hold of the pleura and get an adequate sample, Secondly, to target biopsy, and this is where with a semi-rigid thoracoscope, with a flick of a button, you can get narrow band imaging, which will show some vascular anomalies and guide you to the right spot to take biopsies. There are a couple of publications, this one from Japan, another one from Berlin. Where there is diffuse pleural thickening and it's very difficult to get a full thickness biopsy, which is important for the diagnosis of mesothelioma, you can use electrocautery and make a small incision and take biopsies deeper, provided you have the skill and the experience to do electrocautery and you are an experienced thoracoscopist. Not without risk, and this technique has not been extensively studied, just a few case reports. Plural uh, cryobiopsy, thoracoscopic cryobiopsy, however, has been uh, 
studied, and you can uh, click on the image if you don't mind. There you go. Showing that it's a very simple technique, relatively safe, and there had been a publication from New Delhi there in the middle as well, Rajiv Goel's team, showing that you can do a thoracoscopic cryobiopsy in those patients where you're struggling to take biopsies because of the diffuse pleural thickening. A recent advance is this study, elegantly conducted by Yoka Anima's group from Amsterdam, showing the use of confocal laser endomicroscopy in various lung as well as pleural diseases. And this can show you, with the help of the probe of the needle, where the abnormalities are in the pleura. Very exciting, and studies are being conducted. And that will push up your diagnostic yield quite dramatically, is what we think. That's the hypothesis. Besides the technique, it's also the forceps that you use. We talked about it earlier today. Larger biopsy forceps, I tend to use the gastroscopy forceps with a spike give you a much better ability to pinch and peel and take larger biopsies from the pleura. Definitely something that I would recommend, and the new Olympus scope, which I'll show you in a minute, has also uh, led to the introduction, or will lead to the introduction of this larger forceps. The role of thoracoscopy in mesothelioma extends to the use of talc through the thoracoscope wherever possible, if this catheter is available and there are some modifications of the catheter that you can use, and real time you can sweep around the pleura, parietal pleura, which I'm showing you there in that particular procedure, and spray talc very effectively in a matter of 30 seconds. A, another uh, tool and uh, kit which is available for uh, talc putrage, I believe it's available, I'm told by friends in India, that it's available now, all inclusive, sterile talc provided in this kit produced by Novatech. And all you have to do is take it out in a sterile fashion, connect the bottle, and then spray. A point to remember is that the, any of these techniques, when you spray the talc, as moisture collects at the tip, talc will get blocked after some time, after the first few sprays. And all you have to do is take it out and snip the tip of the catheter because it's quite long, and go back in. You might have to do it two or three times, but all in all, you can complete the procedure in one to two minutes. So, a novel thoracoscope is now due to be launched, I believe, in India. We have uh, had the pleasure of evaluating this in the UK for a few months, and uh, I'll show you some images from that. What is the difference between this new thoracoscope and the existing semi-rigid thoracoscope? Just a few. First of all, you've got bright, clear observation with HD imaging, superior images, very good narrowband imaging uh, pictures as well that you get, particularly if you use it with the EVIS X1, with the BIMAC and RDI TXI capabilities. The second, very, very useful, is the availability of upward angulation going up to 180 degrees. So you can actually see very close to the entry point, the port, the cannula. Thirdly, NBI is further enhanced with, the, with this scope. And finally, the working channel diameter, which was 2.8 millimeter, has been increased to 3 millimeters. How is this important? It seems like just a slight increase, but it does make a difference when you're taking biopsies, when there's bleeding, when you want to apply suctione very effectively. It does seem to make a significant difference. Just some images from this scope. As you can see, Definitely superior images as you go around the pleural cavity. And as we continue to evaluate, I hope that it will also result in greater accuracy in targeting biopsies when uh, we use this particular scope and system. Most recently, what we have done is started a study called the Tactic Study in the UK including mesothelioma play patients. So what we do is we have an intervention arm and a control arm. Control arm is thoracoscopy with talc and chest drain. And in the intervention arm, we add in the placement and in indwelling pleural catheter as well. 
My colleague and friend Rakesh Panchal is also involved with it. This is run from Oxford and Bristol. Um, and we've already recruited, I think, more than 50 patients, and the target is around 124. So watch the space when we get the result. This may be something we need to do in the future. So we're spoiled for choice now. We have a number of different thoracoscopes available, as I've taken you through, all particularly useful in the field of mesothelioma. But some basics remain the same. And I'd just like to emphasize with my usual, my favorite slide, which is not just about learning the technique, about practicing safely. Thoracoscopy in the initial few years got some bad press because people were worried about bleeding and had some people, some people had complications. But if you have suitable training, not just of the operator, but also of the entire nursing unit. So it's a multidisciplinary approach that you use. And second is to choose the patients carefully. The right patient for the thoracoscopy. Wrong patient and you can run into problems. Training, effective training. Professor Lorenzo Corbetta very nicely presented the importance and included thoracoscopy in the training program. Um, and then safety check, always, always. I keep talking about it when I come to India and now I'm really truly pleased to see some hands go up when I ask about safety checks. A WHO safety check is mandatory for any procedure, particularly thoracoscopy. Aseptic technique, I don't need to emphasize the importance of that. There's very little evidence that you need to give prophylactic antibiotics if you carry out everything in an aseptic technique. Sedation, you want the patient to be comfortable, so we tend to use mostly local anesthesia with mirazolam and fentanyl, but a number of other combinations have been tried. And specialist operators, not everybody needs to perform thoracoscopy. We have 15 consultants in my pulmonology department, and only three of us perform thoracoscopy. Okay. Cannot overemphasize the importance of sonography, ultrasonography. That's the most important safety measure. And in the unlikely event that you encounter bleeding, you need to have a protocol. You need to have a bleeding protocol, well rehearsed by the entire team to deal with a bleeding effectively. It's exceedingly rare, and I've hardly ever come across it. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention.